Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Muhammad Ali Rabani. I will be your guide for the next lecture in the series of Gross Anatomy of Neck, Nose, Paranasal Sinuses, and Larynx. As evident from the title, the topics we are going to discuss today are going to be the gross anatomy of nose and nasal cavity, the paranasal sinuses that are related to them, and the larynx itself. We will go into depth for each on every one of these topics. Let's start with the nose. Nose, as we can see, it's the organ of the respiratory system that allows the entry of the air. That's the nose right here. What's its function? The major function is of course respiration. It's a conduit of air. It allows the air to pass through it and as the air is passing through it, it conditions it just like the air conditioner does. It filters it, it humidifies it, it warms it to the body temperature. Humans are obligate nasal breathers, meaning humans have to breathe from the nose if they have to do it from a, for a longer period of time. Even if you op even if you uh, think about your past experiences, when you have a stuffy nose, when you have to breathe through your mouth, you get fixated, your throat dries up very quickly. You can't do it forever. So humans are obligate nasal breathers. And the other very important function that is done by the nose is the sense of smell, the olfaction. External nose, what we can see on the surface. External nose, when we see, <clears throat> it's like a pyramid. It's the uh, pyramidal structure. Here is this A part is the base. The thing that is the upper end. Here is the upper end. This triangle on the lower end is the base. In the base there are openings of the two nasal apertures, the nostrils, the nares. And between the two, the column of skin that is present at the lower aspect that is known as columella. It's a part of the nasal septum. It's the skinny tag that is present. You can actually move it around. If you just pick it up, you can move it around like this. This tag of skin that is present between the tip and the base and this base of the nose is known as the columella. Then this is the dorsum of the nose. This whole area, especially the bony component, this is called the bridge. And where this dorsum meets the forehead, this is called the root. And if you follow the dorsum all the way to the apex, this is called tip or apex. This later expansion of the base that is known as ala. If we look at the skull, we will see the nasal aperture. It is very present deep out inside. The what we can see on the external nose. So this picture is with the cartilage is removed. So this bony landmark, the bony framework, it includes the two nasal bones on the top. They join in the midline with the internasal suture. The two maxillary bones on each side. There are maxillary bones on each side. Frontal process of maxilla to be exact. And on the floor, the maxillary bones meet at the midline and the raised thing that is present in the midline that is known as nasal spine and the anterior nasal spine. So these are the structures that are forming the bony framework. Let's add on to the top of that the cartilaginous structures. First, there are two cartilages that are present just below the nasal bones. This cartilage you can see the boundary right here. This is the lateral nasal cartilage. This is the lateral nasal cartilage. And it is like <clears throat> lateral nasal cartilage 
Netter has written is that later process of septal cartilage. So this is the later cartilage. It is tucked inside the bone above. So this cartilage is going beneath the nasal bones. So it is a little like you tuck your shirt inside. It's tucked beneath the nasal bones above. This is the nasal cartilage. In the anterior end, they have a little distance between them. And then through this distance, you can see this. The cartilaginous component of the, na the nasal septum. The septal cartilage or the cartilaginous component of the internasal septum between them. If you look below, the tip, the columella and the, the lower aspect of the septum, the tip and the ala. This consists of a U-shaped cartilage that is known as major alar cartilage. You can see the the part of it that is on the lateral aspect of the nose that is known as major alar cartilage, and it bends in the midline. And here, this part actually you can see right here. This part is the medial nasal medial crust of the nasal cartilage you can see them better here the part that is outside is the little crest and the part that is on the inside the two medial crusts the two medial crura meet in the midline to form the lower part of the columella so this is the medial cartilage the sorry alar cartilage with its lateral and medial crust an important thing to know is this cartilage does not go all the way to the ala the later most part of the ala, here you can see, it is made up of simply fibro fatty tissue covered by skin. We will talk about skin also. I forgot to discuss in the previous slide. So it is the made up of fibro fatty tissue. Apart from that, there are minor cartilages. They are present in a different places. They may be present in the ala, and there is usually a constant one that is present between the lateral and the alar cartilages. So this is whole about the osteocartilaginous framework just to talk about the skin if you can check on your nose if you place your finger on the root of the nose you can move the skin against the bone below if you go to the dorsum you can move the skin against the bone below but if you go to the ala the skin the, you can move whole of the ala including the fibrous fatty skeleton inside but you cannot move this part independently so the upper part of the skin it is thin and mobile but this part is strongly adherent to the skin below strongly adherent to the tissue below and this is the part of the nose the ala of the nose that contains a lot of sebaceous glands and that is why you get a lot of blackheads here because blackheads come from sebaceous glands so this is the part that is thick and contains a lot of sebaceous glands. <clears throat> so uh, this is what we talked about. And if you take a close up look, you can actually see the openings of the sebaceous gland where the skin is thick and tightly bound here. Then there are facial muscles that are underlying it. We talked about the transverse nasal, nasalis muscle, procerus, dilator of the nostrils, the levator levi, elite nasi, there are different muscles that are attached to the muscles that are attached to the skin beneath the nasal bone, uh, beneath the nasal skin. If we talk about the sensory nerve supply, it is mostly from the <clears throat> it is mostly from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve with a hint of the maxillary division from the lateral aspect. There are three nerves that are important if we uh, we have studied in the orbital cavity that a branch of the nasociliary nerve were exiting the medial aspect of the orbit below the trochlea the infratrochlear nerve this is the part of the branch of the nasociliary nerve that itself was a branch of ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve that exits the nose and supply the root and bridge of part this is the part that exits and supplies the root and bridge part. Then there is an external branch of anterior ethmoidal nerve. We we'll discuss the anterior ethmoidal nerve's course in the orbit, in the lecture of the orbit. 
we will discuss its course in the nose today inshallah as we talk about the interior of the nose it exits if we look at picture here it exits between the junction of the nasal bone above with the lateral cartilage below it exits from there and it supplies the dorsum of the nose all the way to the tip then we are left with only one nerve this is the infraorbital nerve emerging from the infraorbital foramen below the eye and it is a branch of the maxillary nerve as it supplies all of the area in front of the chin bone cheek bone from the lower margin of the eyelid to the upper margin of to the upper lip it supplies the lateral most aspect of the nose also it supplies the lateral aspect of the nose including the ala this is about the sensory supply and the point to remember is that the infratrochlear and external nasal branches of anterior ethmoidal are from the ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve both of them are branches of nasociliary nerve and this little aspect it is from the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve infraorbital nerve when we talk about the arteries these are most of the arteries you have read about in the arterial supply of the face let's just talk about first the branches of the facial artery that are involved in supplying the nose if you follow the facial artery there were labial labial arteries going to the upper and lower lips then there was this branch going to the ala going to the lateral aspect of the nose this was lateral nasal artery as we move above it does give small minute branches and that's it that's about it that's the branches that it give the oh, that's one branch and if you follow the superior labial artery the one that is going to the upper lip it does give the branches to the nose superiorly it does give a branch to the lateral aspect of the ala the uh, the ala that is the vestibular branch and it gives branch in the midline that is going to the columella that is known as columella branch so they are going from the facial artery this is the lateral nasal artery and the arteries that are going from the upper lip supply then there is the branch of ophthalmic artery that are important we did talk about the arteries of the ophthalmic artery in the orbit and the terminal branch of the ophthalmic artery was following the route of the nasociliary nerve and it exits from the same point where the nasociliary nerve, infratrochlear nerve was exiting here its name is a little different its name is dorsal nasal artery depending upon the area of its supply it is supplying the dorsum of the nose <clears throat> it may anastomose the facial artery and then another branch of the anterior ophthalmic artery is this branch that is following the nerve of the same name that is the external lateral artery branch of anterior ethmoidal artery and it is exiting from the same point between the cartilage and the nasal bone above then we are left with this artery this is the infraorbital artery branch coming from the same infraorbital foramen branch of the same maxillary artery and it supplies the lateral aspect of the nose so this is about the blood supply of the exterior of the nose let us talk about the nasal cavity the nasal cavity where it is found what is its extent and walls what are terminates or conca and what is meatus and we will talk about its shape overall this cavity where it is located it is a very beautiful picture from gray's anatomy if you can see the nasal cavity it's lying on the top of the oral cavity in the pink there is an oral cavity above in a purple the nasal cavity is shown what is present beneath the cranial cavity it is present below the cranial cavity it is present above the oral cavity it is present behind the exterior of the nose and it is present in front of the nasopharynx the part of the pharynx that is connected to the nose we will discuss it in our next lecture so this is the location on either side of the nose on the right side on the left side there is this orbital cavity so nose it's in a very crucial position it is 
related to very important cavities on each aspect. Oral cavity below with hard palate intervening. Orbital cavity on the lateral aspect with the ethmoid bone intervening. Cranial cavity above with the cribriform plate intervening and posteriorly there is nasopharynx with the posterior nasal apertures between them. So this is basically we have talked about the walls also. We will talk about what bones exactly form the walls but you have the general idea which structures are present on against each of the wall now. Oral cavity against the floor, nasopharynx across the base uh, back, cranial cavity in the roof, orbital cavity above and maxillary sinus below on the lateral aspect and exterior of the nose anteriorly. To be more specific in defining the extent, we define it by the nasal openings, internal nasal aperture and external nasal aperture right here. So external nasal aperture also known as the nostrils or nares, posterior nasal aperture also known as coena. So these are the structures that are defining the limits and inside the nasal cavity you will see multiple shelves. Nasal cavity is in need of increasing its surface area so it has multiple shelves that are coming on the medial aspect so there are three set of shelves these are known as superior conca, middle conca and inferior conca this is the term that is usually used in the anatomy book the alternate term that I will not be using is turbinates this is turbinates this turbinates turbinates is an alternate word for conca so you may find this terminology in the books also overall the nasal cavity is piriform shape pear form shape pear shape it has a base that is very wide and the apex that is narrow and it's not simple pyramid it goes like this it like a pear it has a structure and one thing that I discuss with the, my students is that they do tend to confuse these two words conca and coena when we are talking about the coena we are talking about the apertures posterior nasal apertures mostly coena and anterior nasal apertures and when we are talking about conca we are talking about these shelves we are talking about these shelves and the turbinates as the cavity is narrow above and wide below the same is with the turbinates the turbinates are smaller above and as we go down they are large below the inferior will be the largest one so the turbinates are basically almost the same distance from the medial septum because as far as the lateral wall goes as medially does the turbinate come to the midline let's talk about the osteology we will discuss each of the wall the lateral medial roof and floor the lateral wall it is a very beautiful picture i'm a little having trouble in placing the picture uh, the uh, place where i took the uh, picture you can uh, write the uh, see the name of the uh, dr muller so d muller so let's talk about the bones this is a very beautiful picture as it adds the bones one by one. If we see at the lateral wall, the major bone that is contributing in the formation of this bone is this maxillary bone. This is maxillary bone is a very huge bone. It is on the front of the cheek. It is forming the hard palate. It is forming the upper jaw teeth and it is forming the lateral wall of the nose. So it is forming a lot of the lateral wall. And in the lateral wall there is a hole of the big cavity this cavity is the maxillary sinus you will see as the bones are added one by one they will form they will close this cavity a lot so this is the maxillary bone then there is a lacrimal bone the lacrimal bone is in the in front of the maxillary sinus it is attached to the maxillary bone you can see the lacrimal bone from the orbital aspect also and you can see it from the nasal aspect also and it is between the two bones that you see the nasolacrimal duct so before the origin of the bone so here is the point where nasolacrimal duct was supposed to be so here is the groove and on the top of it the lacrimal bone was placed so 
here is the now the nasolacrimal bony canal is formed between the maxillary bone and the lacrimal bone on the behind the next one is added here is the palatine bone it is forming the this hard palate the horizontal plate is forming the posterior part of the hard palate and here it is make the vertical plate of the palatine bone it is you see it is partially covering the maxillary sinus also and these are the two processes that are important these are the two processes of the palatine bone i think sphenoidal and orbital and between these two is a opening that is known as sphino parietal foramen we will discuss it later so this is the parietal bone here on the red the uh, the sphenoid bone has been added on the top of it the sphenoid bone that is the body containing the sphenoid air sinus on the back there is the medial pterygoid plate right here there is basically the pterygoid process containing of the medial and lateral bones to so medial pterygoid here so we are almost near the completion and here is an independent bone that is the inferior concha it is an independent bone so inferior by in adding of the inferior concha we have completed the definition of the nasolacrimal duct so it is present between the lacrimal bone and the maxillary bone above and between the inferior concha and maxillary bone below so this is the opening that connects your orbital cavity outside to the nasal cavity inside then there is the one in the shown in the green right here that is the ethmoid bone there here it is only showing the labyrinthine part the lateral part of the uh, ethmoid bone so here it is responsible for forming the roof the cribriform plate it is responsible for forming the superior concha and the middle concha and you can see it is almost now covering the uh, maxillary sinus and on the top the bone that is added is the frontal bone and on anterior aspect there is nasal bone so these are all the bones of the nose the ethmoid bone is a little tricky bone it is like a letter m capital m it has the lateral processes on the each side the these are known as labyrinthine parts light these are shown by the light green and in the midline there is a central part that has a horizontal plate on the top the cribriform plate with a crystal gali projecting towards the top and septum going back downwards that is perpendicular plate that will be forming the part of the nasal septum and this labyrinthine part it will include the superior concha the middle concha it will have the anti ethmoidal air sinuses it within it that will come between the nasal cavity and the orbital cavity and then there will be a space between the there will be this bony process this is the uncinate process this bony process this will be the uncinate process we will be discussing it shortly and it will be defining the space between the two it will be spanning this space between the two that is the hiatus semilunaris going inside to the infundibulum don't worry we will discuss them separately so this is about the lateral wall of the nose this picture we have almost done this the, on the lateral aspect you can see the lateral cartilage the lateral part of the alar cartilage accessory bones the part of the nasal bone the part of the frontal bone majorly maxillary bone inferior concha lacrimal bone and ethmoid bone with superior and inferior middle concha palatine process with sphenopalatine foramen and in the back the sphenoid bone <clears throat> if you remove the middle concha if you remove the turbinate middle concha and you will see you will be able to see what is deeper to it in this picture all of the turbinates all of the concha has been cut a little and you can see the different openings we will be discussing them separately the thing that i want to focus on right now is this bony process this is a raised portion that is known as bulla ethmoidalis that is known as bulla ethmoidalis that will be forming the uh, that is containing the ethmoidal air sinuses and the other thing that we need to focus is this bony projection this is known as the uncinate process 
there is the we talked about the plasma dialysis behind and the unseen process anteriorly and in between the two there is a gap between the two that is known as hiatus semilunaris the space defined by the unseen process and the plasma dialysis this two dimensional space this is hiatus semilunaris and if we move through the hiatus semilunaris to the space deeper to it that is known as infundibulum that is known as infundibulum and infundibulum is between the orbital plate of the ethmoid bone and the unseen process let's look at the medial wall the medial wall is quite simple it consists of on the higher upper aspect it consists of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone on below aspect it is made up of vomer vomer is more prominent posteriorly when you are looking from the back aspect you only see vomer and on the front between the two like a triangle a wedge like septal cartilage it's present between them and that is why you have a very flexible nose you can actually pinch it and move it on side to side so it is due to this septal cartilage it, it is placed in uh, attached to the ethmoidal plate above and the vomer below and below there is a small contribution of the maxillary bone and the palatine bone to the septal cart septum nasal septum and these are known as nasal crest of the maxillary bone and the nasal crest of the palatine bone that actually like giving a grooved placement of the vomer right here this brings us to the floor uh, this is a picture that is in the coronal section looking from the back and this is the picture this horizontal section is cut and we are looking from the top if we look from the top the anteriorly that most of the floor it is made of the maxillary bone the palatine process of the maxillary bone and on the back it is made up of the palatine bone the horizontal plate of the palatine bone there will be a suture between them simply known as the palato maxillary suture and then there is this structure the opening that is the incisive canal that is communicating this nasal cavity with the oral cavity below so the floor of the nasal cavity is exactly the same as the roof of the oral cavity also known as the heart valve roof this was the roof of the oral cavity nasal cavity all the way from front to back so if we follow the roof from front to back we will see and most anteriorly it is made up of the nasal bone then there will be contribution of the frontal bone this is the major part that is the most important part that is the cribriform plate and on the back on the posterior superior aspect there will be sphenoid air sinuses so this is the roof of the nose nasal bone frontal bone cribriform plate and the sphenoid air sinuses sphenoid bone basically the body of the sphenoid bone and as you can see now this is uh, we will we have not we are not discussing the sphenoid bone as a bone individually but just for the sake of discussion you can see on the top aspect there is the fossa for the pituitary gland on the top of the sphenoid so nasal cavity provides an ideal pathway to reach the pituitary gland this is known as trans sphenoidal approach nasal cavity the scope is passed through the nasal cavity you open the anterior wall and then the posterior superior wall of the sphenoid air sinus and reach the pituitary gland otherwise the alternative is to remove so many of the bony structures so many of the nervous tissue of the brain to reach the pituitary gland so this is about the roof of the nose and the cribriform plate is most important because it is related directly to the anterior cranial fossa its meninges and through it or flexory nerve is passing through the lining of the nasal mucosa can be divided into three part this part is the vestibule this part is the vestibule there is a line between the two that is known as lymen nasi and this is the part where we put our fingers this is basically the part where the external skin of the face has up tend to go to line of the inside of the nose this is known as vestibule 
so it has the features similar to that of the nasal by skin external it will be covering with stratopods squamous epithelium with hair actually this vibrissae the hair of the nose the nasal uh, vibrissae and it will be gradually converted into non stratopods squamous epithelium non keratinized stratopods squamous epithelium and then it will gradually turn into pseudo stratified epithelium of the nasal mucosa here the epithelium it is not shown in the picture but uh, we can discuss the epithelium covering the nose and the epithelium covering the outer aspect of the superior concha and the corresponding part of the septum this wall is known as olfactory part it contains the sensory fibers from the olfactory nerve and the epithelium is a little different the epithelium it's a little pale or brown yellowish brown as compared to the rest of the respiratory epithelium then the rest of the whole if we take out the vestibule and if we take out the uh, olfactory epithelium the all that we are left with is the respiratory part it consists of the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and uh, the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium and it will contain a lot of the serous and mucous glands that will be a lot of serous and mucous gland that will be keeping the surface moist and it will contain a lot of blood vessels that will provide the secretions and that will in addition to the secretion they will humidify they will change the temperature of the air let's talk about the na lateral nasal wall we have discussed this vestibular part the vestibule it is forming the anterior inferior part of the lateral nasal wall and then uh, there is the three shelves the three concha the three turbinates these are the superior concha the middle concha and the inferior concha we have talked about their bony bones the inferior concha is an independent bone the middle concha or turbinate a and the superior concha are the part of the ethmoidal bone and they are larger to smaller as we move from down to up the superior concha and between the two the areas that are present beneath them these are known as meatus so beneath the superior concha will be superior nasal meatus beneath the middle concha there will be middle nasal meatus and between the inferior concha you guessed it right inferior nasal meatus and there is another space between the roof and the superior concha that is known as sphenoethmoidal recess so next we will be talking about the these four spaces the three meatus the three meatus and the sphenoethmoidal recess and we will talk about the structures that are opening in each and one of them let's work our way from top down the sphenoethmoidal rest lined by respiratory epithelium been below between the two and the structure that is opening inside it is this the opening of the sphenoid air sinus it is opening it right here this is the opening the sphenoid air sinus let us discuss further on the image below so sphenoid air sinus it is opening into the sphenoethmoidal recess Next, let's do the superior meatus. Superior meatus does contain the opening of the posterior ethmoidal sinuses. It consists the opening of the posterior ethmoidal sinuses. This is the only opening. The interesting thing that is here, the attachment of the middle concha, the attachment of the middle concha known as basilar lamina, basal lamina or ground lamina. Uh, for the middle nasal concha the attachment is the attachment it's called basal lamina alternate name is ground lamina 
this is basically the demarcating line between the ethmoidal air sinuses the sinuses that are opening to the bare posterior superior aspect these are, will be the posterior ethmoidal air cells and the ones that are opening to the anterior inferior will be that will be the anterior group of cells that will include the anterior and the middle ethmoidal air sinuses this is the superior meatus let's uh, get done with the inferior meatus first then we will go to the middle meatus it is a very big topic the inferior meatus contain a very important one opening that opening is the opening of the nasolacrimal duct that is the opening of the nasolacrimal duct the tears the secretion from the lacrimal gland it moves through the orbital cavity through the orbital canal in the or uh, like through the lacrimal canal in the lacrimal duct and it opens here then we are left with this the middle meatus it has a lot of structures and the opening and this whole structure is called ostomeatal complex let us discuss them here here the first thing that the big bony projection the that is known as bulla ethmoidalis the ethmoid bulla it is the due to it is due to the middle ethmoid sinuses middle ethmoid sinuses the middle ethmoid sinus air cells they have raised this wall to form the bulla ethmoidalis in front of it there was the uncinate process here this bone was the uncinate process we saw in the little wall it is right here coming like this between the margins of the two structures this uncinate process and then there is bulla ethmoidalis here is the bulla ethmoidalis and in between them if we fit a piece of paper between the anterior margin of the bulla and the posterior margin of the uncinate process this piece of paper this 2d space this will be known as hiatus semilunaris this is the 2d space this is a piece of paper that is between the anterior margin of the ethmoid bulla and the posterior margin of uncinate process if we pass through this piece of paper if we pass through this sheet if we pass through this 2d plane you go back to a gutter like space this space this gutter like space it is called in front table the space is called in front table so this is the difference between the hiatus semilunaris this was the 2d entry to the 3d in front table but if you are confused by it don't worry if you use it alternatively you don't get scolded that much they you can take the meaning that they are similar to one another but they are not actually so that is what i have been saying this whole gutter like space that is present between the uncinate process laterally and the this this orbital plate of the ethmoid bone medially like here so this space is called in front of between the two and uh, this is the infant block so here this space with, where it was entering by hiatus and it this gutter like area which is present between the two bones the ethmoid bone and the uncinate process that is in front block now there is a lot of openings in the ostromeatal complex on the top of the bulla ethmoidalis there are opening of the ethmoid air cells purple arrows are shown coming out of it these are middle ethmoidal air cells that are opening right here in the infundibulum the most prominent thing are uh, the three sinuses are opening here if we look if we go all the way up it is draining the frontal sinus the opening of the frontal sinus is coming here if we come back the cells of the anterior ethmoidal sinuses these are opening in the floor of the infundibulum if you go low, all the way back then there is the large opening of the maxillary sinus maxillary ostium let us quickly revise in this picture so you have seen all of these things so there was sphenoethmoidal recess 
there is sphenoethmoidal recess giving the opening of the sphenoid sinus. There is superior meatus giving the opening of the posterior ethmoidal cells. There is middle meatus with the ethmoid bulla in back and uncinate process in front and in between them there is an opening called the there is an opening called the hiatus semilunaris getting inside the infant bulla. On the top of the ethmoid bulla, there was middle layer sinuses, ethmoidal air cells. On the top of the infant bulla, there is an opening of the frontal sinuses, frontal nasal duct that is shown by a probe here. There is small, minute dot like openings of the anterior ethmoidal air cells, and on the postural uh, inferior aspect, there will be opening of the large opening of the maxillary sinus of high mole. So that's about it. Here it is not very made prominent. Uh, this in the front of the middle meatus, here is a depression that is known as uh, entrum. Uh, this is known as I'm get, getting a little blank here. I will got, go to go back to it shortly. And in front of it, there is a raised portion that is known as agar nasi. This is a ridge that is present between the two. So this is all about the lateral wall. We have talked about uh, middle meatus, bulla ethmoidalis, set hiatus semilunaris, infant bulum. What is the difference between the two? What was the boundaries of the hiatus semilunaris, ethmoid bulla behind, uncinate in front inferiorly? What was the boundaries of infant bulum, uncinate laterally, and orbital plate medially, orbital plate of ethmoid? We talked about frontonasal recess, this frontonasal duct, canal, frontonasal recess. And then we also talked about the ground lamina that was separating the posterior set of ethmoid cells and anterior set of ethmoid cells. These are the same things that we talked about. The agarnizai. Um, agarnizai are basically the due to the raised area that is due to the anterior ethmoidal air sinuses. The middle terminate has a very unique shape. This picture will be of the middle turbinate of the lateral left nose, the left uh, lateral turbinate, and the purple area that is the attached margin. So this is towards you, towards the outside of the screen. So it has three parts. It has the part that is attached to the inferior margin of the cribriform plate. That is the first part. There is a part that goes laterally to the cribriform plate that to reach the lateral wall and it goes down. This is the second part and the part that goes inferiorly and then posteriorly. This is the third part. This is the attachment of the middle meatus. So middle meatus chiefly consists of this vertical bone in the first part. It consists of the backward facing plate in the second part and it consists of a roof and the lateral wall there are two structures right here roof and the lateral wall and this will be the third part it is shown right here the vertical, the backward directing and the roof part that are the three parts of the middle meters. Don't worry if you forget it, but I just mentioned because in a books where the detail is given, this is mentioned. Okay, uh, let me take a little break here and then we will discuss the blood supply. Okay, let's talk about the blood supply of the nose. The blood supply of the nose is very extensive as you just we talked about earlier in this video that the nose was surrounding a lot of cavities. It was below the anterior cranial fossa, it was above the oral cavity, it is lateral to the orbital cavity and um, to the nostril it is having a connection with the exterior of the face. So it is getting blood supply from each of these areas. On the later aspect, we talked about the sphenopenatile foramen that was between the two process of the palatine bone. So this is the foramen that was connecting the nasal cavity with the pterygo palatine fossa. 
it was connecting that Terrigo Palatine fossa. So it the first set of arteries it will be coming from that. That will be sphenopenetyl for arteries and vein. So this is the arteries that are coming from the Terrigo Palatine fossa and they are the branches of maxillary artery. Then we uh, in the orbital cavity we talked about anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramina through which anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries exit the orbital cavity to enter the anterior cranial cavity and from anterior cranial cavity on each side of the crista cali they dip again to enter the roof of the nose so this is the second set of source of the arteries that is the anterior ethmoidal artery and the posterior ethmoidal artery these are ultimately the branches of ophthalmic arteries the first, the maxillary one was the branch of maxillary artery. The second, ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery was the branch of internal carotid artery. Two set of artery, maxillary artery was the branch of external carotid artery. Okay. The third set of arteries that we can see is from coming from the outside. That are coming from the outside. These are the branches of the superior labial artery. These are the branches of the facial artery, the branch of the facial artery that was supplying the upper lip and the branches coming from here on the lateral aspect, these are called alar arteries. The branch from the superior labial artery, these are the alar arteries. These are the branches from facial artery. Facial artery was branch of external carotid artery. Three sources and the fourth one is right here, this one. This one is the greater palatine artery. This one is the greater palatine artery. The greater palatine artery, it is actually a branch of maxillary artery that was going to the maxillary artery that was going down from the terrigo palatine fossa to the heart palate. It was supplying all of the heart palate and then it climbed up to supply the nose. And it is not actually giving rise the supply to the lateral wall it would be more appropriate to limit itself it to the lateral part sorry the septal wall so these are the arteries that are giving the supply we talked about the different sources of the nose of course it is coming to the nose nonetheless we talked about the major artery that was the branches of the sphenopalatine arteries then there was the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries the arteries that were coming from the face and the arteries that were coming from the palate from the oral cavity let's on the lateral wall uh, let us talk about more of its branches the sphenopalatine artery it supplies most of the posterior lateral aspect of the wall it gives rise to the lateral wall the lateral septal branches the lateral septal branches you may read in the books that they may be further divided into the lateral posterior superior and lateral posterior inferior the name looks like bigger but it is very simple that they are supplying the lateral wall on the posterior aspect and the upper one will be called superior and the lower one will be called inferior they are usually the branches of the sphenopalatine artery that is coming from the pterygopalatine fossa and they are simply doing here but there are some instances where they may be branches of the greater palatine artery also they may come through the bone right here but keep things simple then the posterior ethmoidal artery is very small it just supplies part of the roof and it usually ends in the supplying the ethmoidal sinuses the anterior ethmoidal artery has big glands it enters the roof it supplies the upper part of the lateral wall it supplies the upper part of the septal wall and as it extends, this is called anterior ethmoidal artery, internal nasal branch as it will be inside the nose. It will be on the lateral wall, it will be on the post medial wall. Here it is written as septal branches. Sometimes the word internal nasal branches is used. Internal interior nasal branch of the anterior ethmoidal artery or medially there is a septal branch, literally there is a lateral, uh, lateral branch and it exits the junction between the nasal bone and the plate the lateral plate and it exits as the nasal artery external nasal artery branch of anterior ethmoidal artery 
and this is the one we have been talking about since almost the start of the lectures we talked about this in the face we talked about this in the or in the orbit and we talked about this more importantly just recently when discussing the external supply of the nose and uh, that's about it these are the arteries that are supplying as you can see they have a profuse anastomosis in this area and this area the huge profuse anastomosis this is known as kaiselbeck's plexus the kaiselbeck's area especially on the medial wall it is the name as kaiselbeck's area so we can see the uh, we can let's make the kaiselbeck's plexus it is coming from four sources first sphenopalatine artery from the maxillary artery second the anterior posterior ethmoidal arteries majorly anterior posterior ethmoidal artery from the ophthalmic artery third here it will be septal branch from the superior labial artery as it are coming along the septum and fourth greater palatine artery coming from the nose or uh, coming from the oral cavity and the heart palate so these are the ones that are joining and making the arterial plexus on the medial aspect of the nose so this is all about the blood supply of the nose this is the kaiselbeck's plexus and the kaiselbeck's plexus the area the bony area where kaiselbeck plexus is present that is known as kaiselbeck's area or little's area little's area that is the little's area so this is about the blood supply this is a picture from grand atlas this is from the gray atlas you can pause your videos here and study them thoroughly if you want then there is nerves there are three set of nerves that are going to supply the nasal cavity there will be branches from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve shown in the dark orange there will be divisions from the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve shown in yellow orange tinge and pure yellow in the pure yellow color the olfactory division thus olfactory nerves cranial nerve number two is shown let's go through them one by one first we discuss about the olfactory area that was against the roof of the nose and on the outside of the superior concha and the corresponding part of the medial wall so this is the olfactory area it is simply drained supplied by olfactory nerve cranial nerve number one olfactory nerve it will have lateral branches septal branches they move up through the cribriform plate into the anterior cranial fossa it's simple as that for the rest there is a picture in the keith helmore this picture uh, this is showing a red dotted line i like discussing this red dotted line also very nice very much if you draw a line moving from the anterior inferior to the posterior superior aspect this line this line demarcates the two sources the nasal cavity in front and above it is supplied by the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and below and inferior to it it is supplied by maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve so this is the two branches let us identify the individual nerves on both of the walls on the posterior inferior aspect let's talk about the maxillary nerve branches the branches that are coming from the sphenopalatine foramen to make things a little difficult their name is not shared with the arteries here there are two set of branches the one that is on the lateral wall above the one that is on the lateral wall below these will be posterior superior lateral nasal branches and this will be posterior inferior lateral nasal branches posterior superior lateral nasal branches are coming directly from the pterygo palatine ganglion and the posterior inferior lateral nasal branches are coming from greater palatine nerves that were coming from the pterygo palatine ganglion so indirectly coming from that but directly they are originating from the greater palatine nerve and you can see they are not entering from the sphenopalatine foramen they are coming through the junction between the sphenoid bone and the vertical plate of the palatine bone and another set of artery nerves that are going to supply this is the inferior 
alveolar nerves all the three sets of alveolar nerves the all the sets of superior alveolar nerves the anterior superior the middle superior and the inferior superior they are coming from the maxillary nerve v2 so they are branches of that so these are the nerves that are coming from the maxillary nerve that included the posterior superior nasal branches from the pterygopalatine ganglion directly posterior inferior lateral nasal branches coming from greater palatine nerve and the septal branches of the anterior superior alveolar nerve that was basically branch of infraorbital nerve that is a branch of oh, and you can see the nerve coming inside the nose from the outside this is the branches of the infraorbital nerve that we discussed in the face and external of the nose this is the infraorbital nerve again it was a branch of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve so all of these they sum up to the maxillary supply the v2 supply of the postero inferior part of the wall anteriorly and just maxillary division on the medial aspect it consists of one big nerve that is known as nasopalatine nerve it gives a lot of branches to the medial septum and it exits the nose through the incisive canal to go to the anterior aspect of the palate and it does supply the palate anterior to the <coughs> anterior to the incisive foramen so this is about it and uh, this is about the uh, walls the supply of the maxillary nerve and then we are left with the external nasal branch external nasal branch sorry then we are left with the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve the only nerve that is representing ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve is this anterior ethmoidal nerve it runs on the inside the part that is supplying the antero superior part of the lateral wall it is supplying antero superior part of the septal wall these will be septal branches or lateral branches of the anterior ethmoidal nerve and especially the lateral nerve the exit between the junction of the nasal bone and the cartilage and the one that runs outside to the tip of the nose that will be the external nasal branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve this is an alternate picture from grant settlers uh, keith elmore and atme so you can study this picture by pausing this slide here the lymphatic drainage of the nose it's similarly divided into the two parts the anterior part it is drained with the face it is drained with the face and it drains to some mandibular group of lymph nodes in the posterior group of the nodes it goes with the it drains with the pharynx it goes to the retropharyngeal group of lymph nodes and upper deep cervical nodes this is about the all the supply of the nasal cavity then there is paranasal sinuses paranasal sinuses are there are four named pair of paranasal sinuses there are two frontal these are present in the frontal bone just above the medial aspect of the orbit and they may extend posteriorly into the roof of the orbit also there is a pair of ethmoidal sinuses these are present between the nose medially and the orbital cavity laterally then there is maxillary sinus it's a very big sinus it's a triangular it is present lateral to the nose below the eye and it is covering almost whole of the maxillary bone it is hollow from inside and due to the maxillary air sinus and then we are left with the sphenoid sinus we cannot see we cannot represent on the anterior aspect we have to see from the lateral view so it is on the body of the sphenoid on the posterior superior aspect of the nose so here is a schematic diagram showing the chambers relation the frontal air sinus is antero superior to the nose sphenoidal air sinus is posterior superior to the nasal cavity the ethmoid air sinus is are lateral to the upper half upper part of the nose between the nose and the orbit and the maxillary sinus is mostly forming the lateral wall of the nose and even extending beneath it below it the nasal air sinuses these are lined with the respiratory epithelium and they are epithelium produces mucus and it has respiratory epithelium that has cilia that beats towards it and they bring the cilia to the opening of the sinuses into the nasal cavities and the function of the these is to lighten the weight of your skull 
it makes the skull lighter it gives a quality to your sound it gives a resonance to the sound goonj deti hai awaaz it gives resonance to the sound and it helps in the that is the facial function and the major role is expansion of the skull without adding to the weight too much so this is the functions the innervation and you may see the change in quality of the sound if you have suffered um, i hope so not but if you have suffered from sinusitis and your sinusitis sinusitis get filled you may see the um, change in the quality of the sound maxillary sinus also known as maxillary antrum of five more it is present on the each side of the nasal cavities it is pyramidal in shape let me go back a slide there is a little better um, presentation of the slide so it is present in the maxillary bone it is present below the orbit it is present lateral to the nose and it goes all the way sometimes inside the zygomatic bone too anteriorly it is bounded by the wall that is covering the making the prominence of the cheek by the maxillary bone and on the back it is related to the pterygopalatine fossa and the infratemporal fossa so this is an alternate picture from the grants atlas from the coronal section so you see the relation uh, there is orbital cavity above there is teeth below there is nasal cavity on the medial aspect <clears throat> that said it opens through this opening that is the opening of the maxillary sinus and you may notice that the whole of the maxillary sinus is below it so this is the sinus that gets infected very easily because the fluid has to move up to go to the nose it has actually in the normal situation the cilia are beating that are moving the film of fluid all the way up and when there is a sinusitis and there is actually fluid that is standing here it keeps on accumulating down until the way you lie on your one side and the sinus that is higher it drains and you may have noticed everyone usually go through the flu season once or twice a year and when there is a stuffed nose you cannot breathe through the nose and then you lie on your side and the nostril and the nose that is on the upper aspect like right? i'm lying down on my right side my left nose it sometimes give a flow of fluid this flow of fluid is basically the draining of the maxillary sinus and the nose gets open when you lie down on the opposite side your left cheek touching the pillow and then the right nasal sinus then maxillary sinus drains and if you are lucky enough and if the fluid is thin enough to flow so this is about the maxillary sinus and i will be talking about a few things about it the maxillary sinus first i will be talk about the development all the sinuses except the frontal sinuses are present at birth so these are color coding is done at the level of birth it is a very small slit basically the yellow and it goes on to extend as the person grows in age by roughly 8 years of age the floor of the nasal cavity it's at the level of the floor of the maxillary sinus Uh, in the latest pictures it is written 12 years i was reading the last and at me it was written 8 years so by 8 to 12 years the floor is by this age and as you grow older the floor of the middle meatus middle nasal paranasal sinus is sorry the floor of the maxillary sinus is going beyond that and you can see as the floor goes down and down the thickness of the bone that is separating roof root of the tooth root of the teeth it usually includes the molar and premolar it grows thin and in the older people the root is included inside the maxillary sinus so in very old people you may see a either a very thin cortex of a bone around the maxillary sin uh, around the root tooth of uh, root of the tooth as it is in entering the maxillary sinus or there may be actually no bone at all covering the root it is simply covered with mucous membrane of the maxillary sinus and this point of information is very important 
because dental infections and dental extractions may affect the maxillary sinus and infection of the dental roots may lead to maxillary sinusitis and vice versa an old person and a young person as we go younger and younger there's a thicker uh, set of bone between the two so there is the possible communication and in an older person the teeth tooth falling may lead to a permanent opening of the maxillary sinus in the oral cavity so this is about the maxillary sinus here it ostium accessory ostia and fontanel so this is a little crowded picture and don't be don't get overwhelmed by all of the things at once just keep your focus on the yellow area this is the maxillary sinus this is the gutter of the bone the semilunar uh, this is the infundibulum and semilunar hiatus and as we move down the infundibulum there is an opening in the bone that was the opening for the maxillary sinus so this is the opening that you were seeing from sorry that you were seeing in this picture right here in this picture right here and in this picture right here this is the opening that was you were seeing in the different pictures so here you can see the ethmoid bone is so much this whole area there is no bony covering there is no bone separating the nasal cavity from the <clears throat> there is a no covering the uh, nasal cavity from the maxillary sinus this whole area so the back aspect beneath the unsinate process in the in inferior concha inferior meatus this whole area it's not having any bony difference and this in this area the only separating thing from the maxillary sinus and the nasal cavity is membrane is the mucous membrane covering the nose from the outside in the mucous membrane covering the maxillary sinus from the inside so just like the fontanella of the cranial cavities which are only there is no bone but skin and membrane are this area are called the fontanella of the sinus this area is called the fontanella of the sinus and through these areas additional openings may be present these additional openings one two three labeled in this picture here these are called accessory ostia accessory ostia these are the accessory openings and uh, some of you will be going into the ENT surgery and these are the places the fontanelle where we create artificial openings in a person who gets maxillary sinusitis recurrently and who does not have a very good drainage of the maxillary sinus sinus so this is all about the maxillary sinuses we talked about its relation its extent its development its drainage its ostia accessory ostia and fontanelle so this is about the maxillary sinuses and any inflammation to the maxillary sinus will lead to the tender area in front of your cheek okay next there is ethmoidal layer sinuses first let me show you on this picture ethmoidal layer sinuses are present in the lateral wall of the nasal cavity this is the wall of the nasal cavity on the lateral aspect of the nasal cavity and on the medial aspect of the oral orbital cavity and orbital cavity when we were talking about the walls of the orbital cavity we talked about the ethmoid bone and the part of the bone that was towards the orbit it was very thin and we named it lamina papyracea this is the same thing and on the superior aspect it is covered with the process of the uh, at frontal bones it is covered by frontal bones superiorly and uh, on the back it is covered by sphenoid bone and it is front it is covered by frontal bone and uh, medially there is a nose laterally there is an orbit and uh, below there is simply hiatus semilunaris and these bones these set of bones this set of sorry these sinuses this set of sinuses are divided into two parts depending upon the attachment of the basal lamina the attachment of the middle meatus the sinuses that are present behind and up to the middle meatus in other words that are opening into the superior concha and sphenoethmoidal recess these are known as posterior group of ethmoidal cells and the ones that are inferior to it these are called anterior group of ethmoidal cells 
the ones that we talked about opening on the top of the ethmoid bulla were the middle and the one that we talked about were opening into the infundibulum were the anterior ethmoidal cells these ethmoidal cells may vary in number very much they may be as less as 3 as much as 18 but they are present and they are divided into anterior posterior groups as discussed sphenoidal recess is the one that is present in the body of the sphenoid bone so it has a posto superior relation to the bone nose its septum it is divided into two sphenoid sinuses by a septum present between them that is usually not very strictly in the midline it may be deviating on one side or the other and the sphenoid sinus it's anteriorly anteriorly and anteriorly it is related to the nasal cavity inferiorly and posteriorly it is related to the pharynx here superiorly it is related to the pituitary fossa and on each side it is related to the cavernous sinus containing internal carotid artery and the four cranial nerves so this is about the relations of the sphenoid bone pharynx below pituitary above carotid sinus on each side and anteriorly there is <clears throat> nose and totally posteriorly through a thick bone there will be basi occipital the thing about sphenoid ear sinuses is that it grows larger and it grows posteriorly with age so in a newborn and in a younger person the sphenoid ear sinuses is intro inferior to the pituitary fossa as we go back it may cover whole of the floor of the pituitary fossa in an old person so it depends upon the age and with age the fossa may extend even laterally into the um, greater wing of sphenoid and this brings us to our last sinus that is the frontal sinus it is present on the top in the frontal bone it is usually present in the vertical aspect that part that is making the forehead and it may extend horizontally onto the orbital plate of the frontal bone also the important mcq regarding is this is the only sinus that is not present at birth you may look at at the yellow color that is absent right here it is the only sinus that is not present at birth it opens below downwards into the frontal nasal duct that enters the infundibulum and so it opens here and here you can see that it has an intimate relation with the maxillary sinus any inflammation of the if there is any inflammation of the frontal sinus the infected exudate if it is coming down it will run into the infundibulum and the gravity will do its work and the infection will lead to the maxillary sinus so a person suffering from frontal sinusitis has a very high chance of getting maxillary sinusitis also the reverse is not true because it will have to go against the gravity so that is all about the sinusitis that is all about the sinuses i will be concluding my lecture here i in the beginning i mentioned that i will be using uh talking about the larynx but this video has gone long enough so these are the resources i have been using so thank you so much i will make a separate video i will upload it on the same day about the gross anatomy of the larynx thank you so much if you have any question suggestion or feedback for me please do mention in the comments below looking forward to hearing from you and getting your support see you in the next time good night allah hafiz